All right, today we are going to learn about the Roman Empire and the beginnings of Rome. So we have two daily objectives. Number one, explain how Rome lost its republic. And number two, define the term Pax Romana. So we talked about ancient Greece. We talked about how Greece conquered most of the known world under Alexander the Great and how Alexander the, Gre uh, Alexander the Great died airless. Um, and how his generals split up his empire. Now let's talk about Rome. So Rome is a city. It is a city. It can be very confusing because we've got Rome, the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic, and it all just kind of sounds like Rome. But Rome itself is a city. That city is here, right in the middle of the boot that is known as Italy. See the boot kicking the football. Right in the middle is Rome, and if we look at the peninsula, realize this is a peninsula, look at the peninsula bigger, it's right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So it's geographically, it is in a very, very, very good position to control all of the trade in the Mediterranean Sea because it's right in the middle. We're going to notice that there's lots of mountains, we're going to notice there's lots of rivers, and much like Greece, we have lots of islands, lots of islands. Malta's down here. So... Four major islands are Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and then Malta's down here. Rome, the city, is founded on the river Tiber in 753 BCE. We've talked about why it's important to be founded on a river, because you need water for your crops. It's also actually built on seven rolling hills. And the reason it's built on the hills is because it's easy to defend a hill, because you can throw spears down, you've got gravity helping you, or you can shoot arrows down. So when Rome, the city, was founded, it was actually a monarchy. It had a king, but that last king was driven from power in 509 BCE. And from there, it becomes a republic. So they build the forum, which is where the senators meet, and they do have a republic. So people, specifically the rich, the free-born male citizens, vote for people who go and represent their interests and then vote on laws. That's a republic. And 451 BCE, the 12 tables are codified. These are the first codified Roman laws. And the 12 tables guarantee all free citizens have a right to protect to have a right to protection um, of the law. So we have we have a we have a right um, freedom of protection of the law in the United States. It actually comes from um, originally the 12 tables in the Roman Empire. This is the remains of the Roman Forum in the city of Rome. It's very pretty. So let's talk about the social hierarchy a little bit. So citizens, so citizens are divided into two groups. Patricians, that's the rich, and the pre and the plebeians, that's everyone else. So if we look at our pyramid, we see the patricians are at the very top. These are our wealthy landowners. Um, they've got all the best jobs. They can be consul. They can be senator. Generally, they are the descendants of the founding fathers, supposedly, of Rome. And these patricians can veto laws. Now, below the patricians, we have the plebeians. These are the normal people, but they are citizens. Um, they do have to pay taxes. They cannot lead in government, um, but they own small businesses and that kind of thing. So we have the patricians and the plebeians. They have all of the political power, but realize the patricians have more than the plebeians. Under them, we had freed men. These are men who probably at one point were slaves or foreigners or something. Um, and now they have jobs like craftsmen, traders. They can own small shops and farms, but they have no political power, and they have very few rights. Under them, we have slaves. Now, women in ancient Rome kind of like ancient Greece, don't really have a lot of power, pretty much have to do what the men tell them to do. Um, but patrician women are, of course, going to have more authority, more power, more money, a better life than plebeian women or freed women or slave women, obviously. Let's talk about Roman beginnings for a minute. So like in Greece, uh, all citizens, so all patricians and plebeians, were required to serve in the Roman army. It is called the Roman Legion, the Roman Legion. So the Roman army, that's like the big organization, is made up of legions. So units of, I think, 10,000 apiece. Um, so we have the Roman Legion. And each soldier was called a legionnaire. So this is a Roman legionnaire over here on the right. You're going to notice he's, made, he's got iron armor. He's got a big, tall shield. He's got a short sword called a gladius. And he's got this weird spear thing. So let me tell you how this guy fights. So these guys, they line up, kind of like the hoplite phalanx do, in a large block formation. 
as they get close to the enemy, they're actually going to throw this spear at the enemy. Now you're going to notice that the spear is kind of bent on the end because this is made of lead. The idea is that they throw this, the enemy puts up their shield, their shield they, they block with their shield, this thing lands in the shield, and then it bends. It's made out of lead, lead is soft, it bends, and it bends. So what the enemy has to do is they have to drop their shield. They could try and pull it out, but they're probably pretty close to these guys at this point, so they don't have time to pull it out. And even if they do pull it out because it's bent, they can't throw it back. So now the enemy doesn't have a shield. You have a shield. Your enemy doesn't have a shield. You're going to close on your enemy. You're going to take out your short sword, your gladius. You're going to use your shield to block his attacks. You're going to use your gladius to cut his throat. That's how the Roman, that's how the Roman legions fought. It's a very powerful fighting force. This is the only thing that is able, able to stop the hoplite phalanx because they're able to get rid of the phalanx's shields with this guy. So because of the Roman army's prowess, because it's super powerful and strong and awesome, by 256 BCE, Rome had conquered all of Italy and Rome is in a prime position to control Mediterranean trade. Unfortunately, we have another Mediterranean trader, Carthage, that Rome is going to have to compete against. So in 264 BCE, Rome and Carthage go to war in the first of the many Punic Wars. The Punic Wars are just the wars between Rome and Carthage. Carthage is down here in North Africa, modern-day Tunis. We've got Rome here along the Tiber. So Rome wins the first war, uh, and they actually get Sicily from the Carthaginians. So they add Sicily to what is now a unified Italy. And the second, uh, a Carthaginian general by the name of Hannibal, leads 60,000 soldiers across land and attacks Rome from the north. Rome never saw this coming. This is a really long walk. They have to cross the Alps, which are some of the tallest mountains in the world. Um, and he does. Car uh, Hannibal does cross the Alps and then attacks Rome from the north. Um, for more than a decade, Hannibal raids Italy. He attacks cities. He attacks even Rome. Um, but he, is, he, he fails to defeat Rome itself. Um, his greatest victory is at Cannae in 216 BCE. Rome suffers a terrible defeat. But ultimately, Romans are going to beat back Carthage. In 202 BCE, the Roman general Scipio defeats Hannibal. Carthage is ultimately burned to the ground in 146 BCE by the conquering Romans. And it's 50,000 people are sold into slavery. They actually salt the earth. They take tons and tons and tons of salt and pour it in the ground. That way the ground can't grow food anymore so that nobody could ever live in Carthage again. Very, very intense, very impressive. The Roman government has a number of flaws. So remember, Rome is the city, but now it's got all this territory. It's got all of Italy. It's got all of Sicily. It's even got more than that. It's got all of North Africa now. It's got Spain now because it's taken it all from the Carthaginians. But as Roman territory has expanded, they have not changed their government. They have not changed their government. Um, while Romans and some Italians were citizens, so people who lived in Italy, the vast majority of people that are in Rome's empire are basically just second-class citizens. They can't vote. They can't run for elections. They have no political power. The newly conquered areas in the empire are actually assigned provincial governors, uh, basically a, a rich and powerful patrician. Remember, those are the rich guys, the rich Roman citizens. They're basically appointed to run a province, a newly conquered area. They're basically as dictators. They can do anything they want. Um, a third of the empire's population are slaves as well as former soldiers. Um, they have very little money. They have very little power. They are very, very unhappy. This is a picture of Hannibal's elephants. He actually used elephants in war fighting some of the Roman soldiers, which is kind of cool. And this brings us to the creation of the Roman Empire. So Roman soldiers... Um, Eventually, the patricians and the plebeians, they don't want to work in, they don't want to be soldiers anymore. They don't want to leave their businesses. They don't want to leave their super expensive, nice homes. So soldiers begin being recruited from impoverished people. Some of them are citizens, some of them aren't. They're freedmen. Um, and they owe complete loyalty to the generals who pay them. Between 58 and 50 BCE, Julius Caesar, governor in Gaul, is going to conquer all of Gaul. This is Gaul. It's modern-day France. And afraid of Caesar's popularity and military power, the Roman Senate is going to order Caesar to disband his legions and return home to Italy. Caesar faces a decision. 
he can agree, yes, I will disband my legions and come home, where he may be tried, he may be executed, he has no idea, or he can refuse the order, not defy the legions, and become a traitor. He decides to do the second. He takes his armies, he marches south from Gaul, and he conquers the city. He conquers Rome. He pronounces himself Roman dictator. So he eventually is going to defeat all of Rome's other armies. He becomes the absolute ruler, dictator for life. Um, he does some great things for the city of Rome. He undertakes a number of public works jobs, um, which gives people jobs and gives them an education. He also, he also starts a number of overseas colonies where the poor can gain land and wealth. But ultimately, this is a huge transformation because Rome is no longer a republic. It is starting. It has become a dictatorship. This changes even more after Julius Caesar dies. So Julius Caesar is assassinated by a group of senators on the steps of the Forum, and this begins the Roman Civil War. Octavian, also known as Augustus Caesar, this is Augustus Caesar, um, is Caesar's nephew. He actually inherits all of Caesar's money and wealth and armies and all of his cool stuff. He is eventually going to win the Civil War, gain control of Rome, both the city and the empire. And he formally ends the Roman Republic, so the Senate doesn't even meet anymore. He proclaims himself the first Roman emperor and establishes his own dynasty so that his children can inherit after him. For 207 years after the fall of the Republic and the creation of the Roman Empire under the Caesars, as they're going to be called, peace is going to reign in the empire, and this is known as the Pax Romana period. Um, this is the height of the Roman Empire, and it's going to be composed of about 60 million people, which at this point in history is a very large percentage of the entire population of the world. Take a few minutes, answer your two daily objectives.